3. Philippians chapter 3. Just as I began talking to you here today, I want to pluck out a verse of Scripture that I believe will give us good direction. The third chapter of Philippians is one of the most powerful truths that I have ever found in the Bible. I've always labeled the third chapter as the story of a man who was honest and hungry. But in this third chapter, I just want to pluck out one verse, verse 10. It says that I may know him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, that's Christopistus, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now the reason I read this is that this is the story of a man who has preached 40 years. He has built more churches and brought the gospel to more of the world probably percentage-wise than any man ever has. He's in prison. He's going to have his head chopped off in a few days. He's got God's people all over the world of that day praying for him. There's not one idea in his writings that he hurts, that he's in trouble, that he's in prison, that he needs to get out of jail. His whole heartbeat is in this third chapter where he says the most important thing for me at this point of my life is not getting back in ministry, not getting in out of jail, not getting back to my friends, not living. His whole message is, oh, that I may know him. K-N-O-W, know. Now, if you're going to go on in the Lord, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to come to know him. The whole of the writings of the Apostle Paul center in this knowing. As we've said so many times before, you can't read ten verses of Paul's epistles, but what you don't come across the soulish term, either wisdom, knowledge, understanding, or revelation, all which are knowing terms. The Apostle Paul, being the greatest psychologist that ever lived, knew this one thing about humanity, that it was one thing for God to do something to them, by his grace, it was another thing for them to know it. He also knew that what God did by his grace stands for eternity, the birthing, being born again, Christ in you. But your knowing is something you may never come to on this earth and may need heaven to finally realize what happened to you. So he made a keen separation in the believer's walk. It's one thing what God does it's another thing what you know. Thus I have simplified what is the Christ-like message to these two points. There are two important points or truths or whatever you want to call them that if you're going to be an ongoing child of God, you'll come to sooner or later. Don't care where you go to church. Don't care what doctrines you listen to. If you ever go on with God, there are two things that will determine that ongoing relationship with the Lord. The first important thing is that you must know the difference. If you're going on with God, you must know the difference between what Christ does for you and who Christ is. You see, now in religion, we don't have these two things separated. You think if you know more of what Christ can give you, more of what Christ can do, that that constitutes your knowledge of him, and it doesn't. Because what he does really has nothing to do with you coming to know him. 
Now, how can I make a statement like that? It's simple. Because what he does has to do with your outer man. How do you know he does anything but what you feel it? But what you see it? Or you hear it? These are outer things. Paul was keen to tell us in 1 Corinthians 2 that you cannot hear, see, or feel the deeper things that be of God. And yet so many of us know nothing but what it is we see, hear, and feel about the Lord. So the first great truth an ongoing believer will come to is that he'll see the difference between what Jesus does and who he is. You see, God can keep on doing things for you, and you'll never come to know who you are or how to live and function in this world under God's providence. But it is impossible for you to come to know Him and not know how to live and function here and now in this world. Why? Because one has to do with the outer, the other has to do with the inner. When you come to know who He is, you'll come to know who you are. That's the first great knowledge that breaks to a person that's going on with God. The second is near like it in different words. There's a great difference between you knowing about Christ and knowing Him. You see, in my first thought, there was a difference between knowing what He does and who He is. Who he is can only be known by who he is in you because that's the only Christ the scriptures ever tell us you can learn, Ephesians 2. But it is possible to know all about him and still not know him as your life. For many years I was like this. I was saved, born again, <coughs> knew I'd go to heaven came behind in no spiritual gift, but I didn't know him. I knew much about him. I knew so much about him. I wrote two or three books about Jesus and what he could do, but that's not knowing the Christ that's in you because that's very personal to you. That's very important to you as to who you are. It has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with the incorporation of, of the body it has nothing to do with institutionalized religion. All of this may be okay, but that really has nothing to do with your relationship between you and God. Ultimately and finally, your relationship between you and God hinges on the Christ that's in you. That's where it all comes down to. There's no way you can pray, God, I want you to know, I want to know you aside from the Son. There's no way that God can reveal himself to you aside from the Christ he has birthed in you. You're not an Old Testament saint. You can't pluck scriptures out of the Old Testament and say, well, here, Abraham knew him. Abraham walked with him. Abraham talked with him. We're not in that same period of time. That's not the way God deals with us. Now he has birthed his son in us. And the only way you can come to know God is by the Christ that is in you. That's why Paul said to the Ephesians, you have not learned Jesus yet. That's why he said to the Galatians, I see no difference between you and the rest of the Gentiles. You're saved. You're full of the Holy Ghost. But he said, I don't see any difference in you. That's strange, isn't it? They hadn't come to know Christ. They knew about Jesus of Nazareth. Peter, James, and John had come through town and tell them all the stories of walking and talking and sleeping and eating and working with Jesus of Nazareth. But they still didn't know Christ. You see, that's the ominous term. Do you know Jesus? I don't mean do you know about him. I don't mean do you know who he is. I mean do you know him? Because him in that relationship is the here and now of the Christ that is in you. Do you know him? Do you know the Christ that is in you? What does that mean? That means that the Christ that is in you only comes out of you like you are. Do you know him in that regard? 
Jesus of Nazareth doesn't come out of you. God the Son co-equal with the Godhead and the Trinity is not what comes out of you. What comes out of you is Christ as you. You're expressing him as you see it, as you understand it, as you know it. But if you don't know him coming out of you as you are, you don't know Jesus. Now, I didn't say you didn't have him. Didn't say you wouldn't go to heaven. Didn't say you wasn't saved. I just said you didn't know him. So the point of what I have to talk to you about today hinges on you making the distinction between knowing what he can do and knowing him. Knowing him as you are. Because that's the Christ that comes out of us. Well, finally, you can't separate the Christ that is in you from the Scriptures. So as you search the Scriptures, as you go into the Word, you're able to see this Christ who has been put into you. And then as you see him expressed or coming out of you, that's how you get to know him. I don't read a book about some great missionary and say, oh, I'm going to be like him because I can't be like him. I don't even read about the Apostle Paul, and Paul didn't let us do this in his writing, but I don't read about Paul and say, I want the Jesus that was in Paul. The only Christ that's real to you is the one that God put into you. Do you have some feeling or understanding for that? That's what we're here really to, to, to talk about today, is our feeling and understanding of the Christ that is in us. If I were to put before you the tripartite man again, this is uh, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, let's say your spirit has been, your spirit is joined to his spirit, and as Paul says, uh, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, so you have Christ in you. He's the spirit. The self is made up of body and soul. That's what the human self is. If I were to tell you the important thing about Christianity, it would be the direction that your soul mind takes. This is where your mind is. All of our relationship with the Lord, our mind has been taken from the Christ that is in us to some Christ out here in uh, maybe a church house. We'll call it religion. If the only Christ you know is the Christ that's outside of you, then you have been not only in an impossible task as a Christian all your life trying to live like him, but you've never come to find out about yourself, who you are. Did you know that most of us never find out about ourselves until we get into a real crisis of some sort? Some of us have a crisis with crutches, drugs, or alcohol. Uh, some of us have a crisis with another drug, religion. Uh, getting out of that, getting that changed in our minds uh, because we see that that was not revealing to us who we were. As I often say, uh, your identity now as a Christian is Christ. That's your identity because you've been rebirthed. You're no longer a German or Irish or Scotsman. Your identity now is Christ if you've been rebirthed. You still may have the outer form of these things, but that doesn't count to God anymore. <coughs> and neither does religion. You can't be a Christian and be a Baptist too. You can be a Christian who goes to a Baptist church, but you can't be both. You only have one identity. You can't be a Christian and be Pentecostal. You can't be a Christian and be charismatic. You're a Christian who may do charismatic things. You're a Christian who may be Pentecostal in attendance, but you can't be both. Your identity must be settled upon sooner or later. You can't be a Christian, according to Paul's teaching, and be a Jew or a Gentile or a Greek or a German or an Irishman. You have to make your mind up who you are. Well, you go through life and you never do that. The scriptures plain that there is no Greek or Gentile or Jew in Christ. That's your seat of trouble when you come before God because he sees you as one thing and you keep wanting to be another. So your mind never really changes as to 
who and what you are. Well, what happened to you when you became a Christian was that God put Christ in you, but your mind never settled on that. Your attention was never given to know the Christ that was in you because the Christ that's in you is going to come out of this self like this self is. That's the way he comes out of you, like you are. Well, that may mean finally that you have to change the way you are and change the things that you do. That's what happened to all of us. You know, I've told you before, God's not in the business of changing our lives. Christ is not in the business of changing lives. I know you hear that everywhere you go, but that's not his business. His business is not to change a life, and he has not changed us. What he did to us was inhabitate us. That's different, you see. He didn't perform an outer miracle on this soul and body here and say, well, I'm going to make you everything you ought to be. No, he put his son in us and told us to grow up in him. Come to his knowledge. But we still have these deep roots in us, like the deep root of the law. And every time we turn around, we're saying, well, God, uh, do this for me. Do that for me. God says, I can do no more for you. You have Christ in you. Grow up in him. Let him come forth. Learn him. Study him. That's why you have such a battle with your life and the way you live, is that you keep reaching outside of yourself for this answer. The answer is in you fellow said to me the other day, said, well, the things I want to do, I just can't do. Oh, I said, that's a lie. That's something Satan put there. He's a liar. You're a Christian. You're born again. If you make your mind up to do it, you can. Well, I've done that again and again. Ah, but I said, your mind is only made up when it turns to the Christ that's in you. Then with Paul, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can't do it in your own strength. That's what you got to get rid of. You can't do anything in your own strength. But you can by the life that's in you. So instead of turning your mind to an outside God that says, God, I'm weak, I'm powerless, I can do nothing, please come and help me. Turn your mind to the Christ that is within you. Turn this soul to your spirit. Let soul and spirit be joined together in a union and say, ha, ah, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I can do it. It's a matter of the mind. Paul said it in another way. He said, allow this mind to be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the next thing you've got to get settled in your walk, is where is Jesus? Where is he? If you're going to have a mind that's lacking unto his mind, then where is he? We've got a fuzzy notion that he's in somebody's book I read. He's in somebody's training. He's in some school or he's in a tape or he's over here in a church building. No, the only Christ you can learn is in you. The only mind of Christ that you can get is from the Christ that's in you. That's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel did not change men from what they were. It put Christ in them so he took on their life and they expressed him as they were. That's what God's intention was. Well, we've all got some fuzzy notion that the Lord's going to make us all angels. No, angels are created, not birthed. You've been birthed. You're a different creature. You're a whole different creature because you've been born again. You're birthed. And now with Christ in you, you can do all things through this Christ who now is your strength. The scripture didn't say you had any strength. It said it was his strength. Well, that's a new way of living. That's a growth that we've all yet to come to. We're in different stages. That's why I hammer on the nail a little bit every time we get together because you obviously are, are, are like I am. We're all human beings in this room, maybe except one or two, but we're all human beings. <laughs> And when we, we get together, I sense that we need to hammer on this one thought, this one idea, until we get it fixed in our mind. Once you get it fixed in your mind, you'll stop going outside of the Christ that is in you because the way you're going to have to live is according to the Christ that's in you. You can't live according to somebody else's rule. 
You've got to live by the Christ that's in you. Well, you say, well, that means we're going to all be different. It's true. That means I could never build another church. I built two, uh, uh, three churches. That's what, three? Yeah, three, three churches in my lifetime from scratch. Just started out with a little handful of people and built churches. Uh, I can never do that again because I had to stereotype all these people. I had to get them all thinking alike and praying alike and living alike, working alike and doing alike, or else I wasn't going to get enough money to build my next building. So I had to put them all together and put them in the burden and, and the, uh, uh, under the load of what it was we were doing, and so we had to all be one. But the fact is, uh, I had dissension along the way. I was like the Israelites in the wilderness, a lot of grumbling and griping all the time. They we're getting miracles every day, but a lot of grumbling and griping. Why? Because you can't put people together like that if they're going on in God. They can only go as far as you put them together. You understand that? I come out, I, I, I'm, I'm a Baptist. I started off as a Baptist. Baptists don't want you to get further than being a Baptist. They don't want you to be Baptist and Methodist too. They sure don't want you to be Baptist and Pentecostal too. Just be Baptist. That's their doctrine. That's what they teach. That's okay. But that doesn't fit people who are on going with the Lord. If you're going on in the Lord, if something's ever happened to you where you know you need to know the Lord in a greater way, you're going to break from the stereotyping and you're going to move into this wonderful area where God created you a certain way and your whole venture of life is to become what he created you to be. But the scripture says you can never be that creation without Christ in you, Colossians 2.10. Christ is your completeness. He's the only thing that completes your creation. Well, you're going to have to come to that sooner or later. These things we've talked about many times. But how do you come to that knowledge of the Christ that is in you and how do you live it day by day I have a great burden at times and I try not to voice it I don't voice all my burdens because it'd be easy for me to pick on this wonderful and great host of people who have come to see Christ as their life around the world it'd be easy for me to pick on them and tell them what's wrong with them I have that in me, you know. Before, before I knew Christ was my life, uh, I had it in me to straighten out everybody, to preach hell hot and heaven full of security. Only f just a handful is going to get there. You better straighten up if you're one of them. I can do that. I did that for years. And I'm sure God uses that. He used it in my ministry. He, he can use the ignorant and the dumb, and he did that with me. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is you learning the Christ that is in you. Galatians 1. The certified gospel is the revelation of Jesus, and the revelation of Jesus that is available is the one that's in you. That's the only one that's available. So I quit jumping on people, and yet every once in a while I get overwhelmed with it because I see people who know better doing things that are going to hurt them. I see people in our own groups that are doing things they're going to hurt from. I see people missing fellowship, and they, they ought to have been there. They ought to have cleared the time and been there, whatever it cost them, because they're going to need that fellowship. I see people who don't give to God, and they ought to give to God because they're going to need God's help sooner or later, and I think the Lord does keep some books. I think there are people doing promiscuous things. I give them freedom. They got, they got glorious freedom in the Christ life. You're free to do whatever you want to do. I won't jump on you for doing anything, except I'll tell you, you probably pay for it if it violates your knowledge. See, and I don't have to preach about that. You're going to have it to happen. We preached about that before. But I get overwhelmed with the fact that we get promiscuous. We say, well, I can do this. I've got Christ living in me. He's going to come out of me like I am. I can do as I please, and you can use... The gospel is a license. Grace is a license. Paul dealt with that again and again. But that's costly. That costs you to do that. When you violate your knowledge, it costs you to do it. 
It just depends on how big a price you want to pay to live in this world. Uh, personally, I paid enough price living in this world. I paid all my dues to this world. You ever get that feeling? I paid it off. I've done everything it asked me to do. I've been everywhere it told me to go. Uh, I've got all my dues paid to the devil. I don't need to do one other thing to please him. I pleased him 100%. But I paid for it. I paid for it. So in your daily walk, you've got to get it fixed in your mind which Jesus it is you're looking to. Are you looking to the Christ in you? Or do you ignore him, violate your knowledge, and say, well, the Christ out there will forgive me. I can go on. Sure, he'll forgive you. He loves you. But you'll pay for it. Then how do we walk in the Spirit? How does a modern-day believer who knows that Christ is his life Walk in the Spirit. What does he do by the Spirit? Well, there's a verse of Scripture, I think, that's got answers for us today. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts, the 17th chapter. Acts, chapter 17. And I'm going to tell you about a special group of people that I'd like to see every one of you become. Well, that's not right, is it? You can't become them but we can get a good message from this group of people, and they're called the Bereans. Now, did you ever hear about the Bereans? Did you ever know what a Berean was? They're only mentioned a couple times in the Scriptures, and we're going to read about the, one of the verses that tells about them the most in Acts 17. It's actually Acts 17 and verse 11. It says that these at Berea, from verse 10, these were more noble than those at Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That's a good verse of scripture, isn't it? You've read that lots of times, haven't you? But I felt like we ought to talk about it today because it has some truth in it that I think we have a tendency to forget. You know why you would take liberties with this walk you have in the Lord and do things that are contrary to your very knowledge simply because you know you'll get by with them? Because you're not in the Word. What benefit is the Word? What benefit is the Word? It's the only thing that turns us to Christ. I mean, just to Jesus. It's the only thing that just turns us to Jesus. Excuse me here. I'm really getting mixed up in all of these cords. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Never got so messed up. It's the only thing that ultimately and really turns us to Christ. Let's look, look at it like this. The Christ that is in you is the Word made flesh. This is our tendency in our walk with God. In our minds, we don't have the Word properly fixed as a person within us. And so what we do in our minds as Christians is belabor the Scriptures. You turn to the Scriptures. You've got a real burden in your heart, you go to the Scriptures. You've got a great need, you turn to the Scriptures. You know somebody that's in trouble, you give them a Scripture. That's okay, the Scriptures are wonderful and powerful. But as I've told you many times, there's a great difference between the Word and the Scriptures. What is that difference? You can look into the scriptures and find something for you to do and immediately it'll trigger in you a thought, I better do this. I better do this. The Bible says to do it. I better do it. So what have you done? You have ignored the word that is in you. And you have gone to a scripture and you said what? I. I. Self, I better do something about this. I better pray through. 
I better get a hold of somebody that can pray for me. I better do something. So what would you do? You went outside of the Christ that was in you to the Scriptures, and you found yourself doing something. Now what happens when you start doing something with the Scriptures? You get licked. You're licked. How many of you ever stood on a Scripture and had a problem standing there? Yes, sir? You get licked. You know why you get licked? Because it is not you that ought to be doing that. It is him. It is he that is in you. I'm in Romans 6 now. The chapter tells the believer how to live. It is him that ought to be doing it. It's Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. What's our best translation of that? I can do nothing within myself. What is that? Law number four of the twelve. I can do nothing within myself. What do you do? You try to do it yourself. You stand on the blessed scriptures. You believe in the Bible. But you couldn't make it work. I've had scores of people on drugs to come to me and say, well, I stood on the scripture, but I just couldn't make it work. Worked for a day or two. Did well for a little while. Why couldn't you continue? Because it wasn't in you to do it. It wasn't in you to do it. It wasn't his intention that you do it. Never was God's intention that you live the Christian life. He wouldn't have gone to all the trouble of offering his sacrifice, killing his son on the cross, if he's going to turn around and depend on you to do it. Never was his intention you do it. It was always his intention that another live in you. Oldest verse in the Bible, Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Never was his intention that you live it. It was his intention that another live in you from the very beginning. So you see what you did? You turned to the scriptures outside of you. You had a hard time standing on them, making them work. Sometimes you do. I did it for years, made it work sometimes, but I was always grabbing a new scripture. I had to have something fresh all the time. But that's the difference between the scriptures and the word. This Christ that is in me is the word. And the word is a person. It's one thing to stand on a verse of scripture where you say, I've got faith, I'm going to get faith from this, I'll get faith to make this work. And it's another thing for you to stand on the word where you say, not I, but him. Not me working, it's him working. Well, I'll not deceive you. That only belongs to the ongoing believer. Babes in Christ are going to stand on scriptures, but ongoing believers are going to grow up to one day to where they say, it isn't me, I can't do it, it isn't in me to do it, it's him. He's the one that lives. I can't reckon myself dead to sin. I can only reckon myself dead to him on the cross. I can't stop my sinning within myself. I can only reckon myself dead by what he did at Calvary. It isn't me, it's him. Coming to that has to do with the scriptures, searching the scriptures. Now, this verse we're dealing with says, they searched the scriptures. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word. Now that's the first thing I've got to emphasize to you. You need to receive the word in knowing the difference between Christ the word and the written scriptures. All scripture is inspired. All scripture is of God. But all scripture does not disclose Christ like you're seeking for the word. Seeking for the word. When I open this book, I very seldom go by the scriptures anymore. I look for the word. What is the word? The word is a person. 
The Word is a person. When I read my Bible, I'm looking for that person. Because you see, I don't need what I think is my need. What I need is Him, to know Him. That's what I really need. It isn't healing we so often need. It's knowing Him. If you know Him, healing takes place. It isn't the overcoming of our problems or our sins that are most important. It's knowing Him. It's by seeing Him. Well, that's the Word. That's the difference between the Scriptures and the Word. Seeing Him. So these Bereans at Thessalon, at, at Berea, are claimed to be more noble than those at Thessalonica. I don't know what they had at Thessalonica. That seems to be a good group of people too. But Paul sure made a distinction here, and I'm given to making distinctions every once in a while. Knowing him. Now let's talk about what is noble for a moment. What is a noble believer? They're the people who love the word. They love the Word. Why? They know the Word is a person. I buy books all the time. In fact, I had a man that uh, has written a very good book that was in our meeting in Portland here last month. And it's a book on early church history. I mean, it is the most, it is the most, uh, I start to say deep. It's not deep spiritually, but it is the most, it has the most depth in figures and dates and things that I ever saw. I never knew anybody would go to all that trouble uh, to do all this. But he did it. He published the books, published it by the same publishing house that publishes some of our books. And so I had an interest in, in what he had to say. And his dear brother, he sat through the meeting and took it well as a preacher. But uh, my interest is not in the figures. My interest is in the person. The person, the real depth person of Christ. When I open my Bible, I want to see Jesus. That's what this word noble leads us to. They, they had become a, a noble people like a, a very uh, high caste group of people, a very regal people, a very kingly type people. They were noble in this sense that when they opened their Bible, they wanted to see family relationship. They wanted to see this person who had made the difference. That's what the word noble leads us to. They were interested in the word. They were interested in the word. What is a noble believer? It's one who allows the word to dig deep. Now I'm going to put it to you plain. A believer will only stop their sinning when they let the word dig deep. What does that mean? What is the word digging deep? It's when this believer in his soul mind has the constant consciousness that Christ is in him. He has a constant consciousness that Christ lives in him. With that constant consciousness, he directs his expression what he does by body. He tells his body what to do. He rules over his body. Just like spirit rules over soul, soul, mind, rules over this body and tells it what to do. He digs deep. He goes deep in his thinking. He gets up in the morning and he says, Christ is alive in me. Wherever I go today, the only strength I have is Christ. The only knowledge I have is Christ, whether I'm selling cars or typing a typewriter or teaching school or whatever I'm doing, digging ditches. It is not I. It is Christ who is doing this. He digs deep into himself for the consciousness of who he is. And that guides him all day long. He may have he may have a, a moment where he gets off that track. And the moment he gets off that track, the consciousness brings him back and says, this isn't Christ, that wasn't Christ, and he gets back on the track. 
He digs deep. That's what a noble believer is. He never leaves that consciousness. Husband and wife relationship. They may get angry for a moment, but they won't maintain it as Christians. Now, they might as some kind of Christian, but not as a Christ person, because they'll dig deep. And the Christ in them can bear all things, tolerate all things, love through all things. No way you can get around it. They dig deep. That's what a noble believer is. When it comes to the Scriptures, that noble believer goes further than what the Scripture says and says, I have Christ living in me. That's what guides me today. That's what leads me today. I have a fellow I'm dealing with. He's a salesman uh, down in Dallas, and he calls me when I'm home, and I've gotten trying to get one message across to him that it isn't you selling, it's Christ. And finally, he's getting that consciousness that this is Christ standing here. And he said to me uh, just a couple of days ago before I came here, he said, you know, I was making a, a deal with a lady the other day, and I could see I was leading her down the salesman path. I was really buffaloing her about her finances and so forth. And he said, immediately something strange happened. It jerked me back, and I caught myself saying, Lady, I'm sorry. I've misled you a little here. Let me tell you what really is going on. And he said, I was all of a sudden jerked back to this Christ that was in me to tell her the fact about her finances. Instead of me making a sale, he said, Lo and behold, I did make the sale. But he said the important thing was I sensed that I could be brought back on track by the Christ that was within me rather than me doing what was natural to this woman and selling her. That's what the gospel is all about, and that's what God has done for us. Those at Berea were more noble as believers, and this is what they did. What did they do? They received the word. They received the word. I'm going to tell you the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life as a believer who loves the Bible is to turn from the scriptures directing you to receiving the word. It's going to be hard on you. You know why? Because you probably got a scripture for everything you do now and you're trying to walk in it and live by the light of it. And that's hard to do. And you need to come to the place to where you see the distinct difference between receiving the word and trying to do what you feel the scriptures are telling you to do. Just remember this about you living by the gospel or by the scriptures. You can't do it. Ultimately and finally, you'll fail. I think God's fixed it so you'll fail. You can do nothing within yourself. You can only do it as you receive the word. This means one other thing. This means that to receive the word, to know the difference between the Christ that is in you and God outside of you, to receive the instruction from the Christ that is in you, you're going to have to be open to the word, to receive that word. You're going to have to be open. What does it mean to be open to the word? It means you're going to have to see through it to Christ. See through it to Christ. You're going to have to become a see-thrower. We talked about that years ago, I guess. We're all see-throughers. We see through everything to Christ. If you look at the problem, you're going to be overwhelmed. If you see through it to Christ, there's victory. Because Christ is your victory. Christ is your all. Glad you had that little song that says, Christ is all two or three times in it. You've got to see through him being all. It isn't you. It's him. And so you, you are ready to, to uh, receive the word, the person of Christ, as, as the means by which you carry on. Now, the next thing this verse says is that they had readiness of mind. Readiness of mind. Do you ever get your mind ready for anything? A student who wants to pass his test takes time to study. That's getting the mind ready. But the Apostle Paul 
had another word for it. He said it's the renewal of your mind. That's a better word. As Christians, we need to renew our minds. Why? We got faulty thinking, erroneous thinking, ignorant thinking. Ignoramuses think you know. Sometimes you have to think to be dumb. So you have to change your thinking. You change your mind about things, and that's renewing it. Well, let's talk about changing our minds. When you come into the Christ life and begin to see Christ as your all, you'll have a radical change in your mind. And a lot of people think that means not believing anything they ever believed. That's not so. What that means is to renew your mind, you set aside what it is you think and take in the new information that it might rule you over what you think. Not destroying what you think, but ruling, overruling what it is you think. That's what's important about renewing your mind, thinking differently. That's when you take a course in college, you, you, you get new information you never had before. You don't throw away the old information, but all of your old information becomes tempered or adjusted by the new information that you have. You have renewed your mind with new facts and new information, new thoughts. They had readiness of mind. A believer who goes on with God keeps a readiness of mind to hear what the Spirit has to say. Now, this is very important. The Spirit never talks to you about anything but Jesus. I'll die for that statement. I've been in Pentecost 43 years as a preacher, and I've got to tell you, that I've been misled many of those years into thinking that the Holy Spirit was ready to talk to us about everything else. He isn't. Jesus said plainly in three chapters, several times in three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16, he said that the Holy Spirit would speak of nothing but me, reveal nothing but me. He wouldn't talk about himself. He'll speak only about me. Our prophecies to deal with other people's lives should be Christ-centered. If Christ isn't in it, throw it out. For instance, he's not going to come along and deal with every little detail of your life once you have a renewed mind. We've talked about this so many times. He's not going to settle down to what kind of car you should buy and where you should live and what kind of job you have. He's going to open doors, and by the knowledge that you have, you move through these doors according to the knowledge that you have. What his great interest is that you listen to the Holy Spirit who tells you about the Christ that's in you, revealing the Christ that is in you, making you aware of the Christ that is in you. Why? Because... That's the answer to your need, is Christ. So the Holy Spirit's need is to reveal this Christ in you. That's why the Holy Spirit deals only with your soul mind. That's the only place he's located in the human being is in your thinking, in your mind, in your soulish part, constantly dealing with the Christ that is already within you. But then there's one other thing about this, it said, they search the scriptures daily. They search the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things they were taught were of God. Now, that's very important. I'm not interested in you believing what I believe. In fact, I don't care what you believe. And you shouldn't care what I believe. What we believe doesn't hold the weight to in whom we believe. That's the bigger thing. It's in whom you believe. We've all got different ideas that would separate us in a second if we begin to carry a flag that said, this is what I think, what do you think? Well, somebody else is not going to think what you think. So throw that out. What ties us together as believers is that one blood, that one life, Jesus, that flows through the body. That's what makes us one in this room, is Jesus. 
So what you think about every little thing doesn't matter. You have a right to think what you want to think. You have a right to broadcast it if you want to. But that isn't what brings us together. That's not what ties us together. And a whole lot of things we believe are it don't matter things anyhow. But they searched the scriptures to see whether or not the things they were being taught were of God. Whether or not the things they were being taught were of God. If ever you come to one of these meetings and don't search the scriptures to find out what I have said is true or not true, you're only misleading yourself because I tell you right off, you need to search the scriptures. What do you see when you search the scriptures that makes a difference? You see him. When you open that Bible, you see Jesus. If you don't see Jesus, there will be no life in anything you study. There's no life in Abraham if you don't see Jesus. There's no life in the Apostle Paul if you don't see Christ. There's no life in Jesus of Nazareth unless you see that life in yourself. So we search the scriptures to see whether or not the things we're being taught are of God. As we do this, we grow up in him and come to know what it is God wants us to know. In 1958, I began a search of the scriptures. Prior to that time, I had preached about 11 years. And I'd preached in high places. In fact, I'd taught in two colleges by that time. But I had never searched the scriptures. I didn't know how to search the scriptures. I didn't know what it meant to search the scriptures. Well, one day in desperation in 1958, I said to the Lord, and I was in big healing ministry at the time and was very successful, very successful, big crowd, big everything, lots of miracles. But I said to the Lord one day, I said, you know, I think I've learned how to do this. I've learned how to do it. I was being open and frank with the Lord in a prayer and I said, I, I realize I go out on that stage some nights and I can make that crowd do things. I can stir that people up to where a lot of them believe they get healing. Sure they did. I'd learned how to do it. There were other times I prayed real hard, went out there. That, those are the times I felt like the Lord was doing something. The other times I felt I, I got the same result. I know how to do it. So I just said to the Lord one day, I said, well, I could sell used cars. Maybe make as much money as I'm making now because if this is all there is to it, I've learned how to stir this crowd. I know what they ought to sing. I know what they ought to do. I know how they, they ought to give. I know how to get a miracle from them and to demonstrate that miracle to get them come back again. I knew how to do it. I'm not saying the Lord didn't have a hand in it, and certainly he did heal and bless a lot of people. But I knew I knew how to do it. I could be dry as shucks and go out on that stage and turn it on just like a hillbilly singer. I knew how to do it. So the Holy Spirit did a precious thing to me because I had a mind that had always wanted to know God. I always wanted to know God in depth. And the Holy Spirit must have known that because the Holy Spirit said, I tell you what, if you really would like to know God, I want you to search the scriptures. Search them. Search the scriptures. Well, I didn't know much about that. What do you mean search the scriptures? I read the Bible all the time. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to search Paul's epistles. Get in Paul's epistles and live there. And the Holy Spirit then taught me how to pray the scriptures, how to read them to God when I didn't understand them. And the Holy Spirit suggested don't read anything else, just stay in Paul's epistles. Well, I did that. And I learned what searching the scriptures were. I saw something from reading Paul over and over again that it wasn't what he said to do, it's who he pointed us to. He didn't even say you could have righteousness 
except in Christ. You couldn't have a blessing except in Christ. You couldn't be rewarded except in Christ. And that's the first thing that gripped me. Why, this man has said something I've never realized and have never heard anybody else talk about. He's saying all of these blessings are in a person, in Christ. Read it. 146 times everything he said that comes from God was in Christ. 200 times the New Testament says we're in Christ. Well, searching the scriptures and reading that over and over, finding it 13 times in the first chapter of Ephesians, he says it's in Christ. I never got that from studying. I never got that from studying the Greek. I used to teach Ephesians uh, from the Greek. Uh, I didn't know Greek that well, but we had books that told us how to do it. <laughs> and I never got that. In fact, they had ignored the in Christ statement. Most all the books did. Searching the scriptures, I begin to see you don't have anything aside from Christ. And Paul said Christ was in you. Every time it said in Christ, you can't be in him without him being in you. It's a union. You can't be baptized into Christ and not go into him and he go into you. You can't separate the two. And I thought, my, we've neglected this. I've never preached this. I said, get full of the Holy Ghost and you'll have answers. That isn't what Paul said. Paul says, you're in Christ. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. As I searched the scriptures, I began to see that. I had a whole new Bible to open up to me. I marked that Bible awfully. Because I marked every one of those times he said we were in Christ. And everything had to do with Christ. There was no blessing you get by faith. It was in Christ. There was nothing you get by your own power. It was in Christ. There was nothing you get by living the holy life. It was in Christ. Those things appeared to be contrary in time. That I was contrary to what was written in the Bible because I hadn't searched the scriptures. And that's why you need to go to the Word. That's why you need to search those scriptures until they become impregnated in you as a person. Christ the Word. For two years I did this. Two best years I can remember because I was having big meetings every night. What was that, 58, 59? I had meetings right here in this area. We had a big tent, seated 3,000 people. Had big meetings here in the, in the, what, the Assembly of God Church in San Jose and uh, Bethel, Bethel it was called in, I think. Big meetings all over this area. God moved, God blessed, lives were changed, lives were set free but I was only coming to know Christ. I didn't know Christ. I didn't know him. But the searching of the scriptures brought it about. And in 1960, in Atlanta, Georgia, big meeting, 70 churches supporting that me meeting in the big downtown auditorium. I'd preach in morning and night and on a Thursday afternoon in October, 1960, I was laying across my bed in the old Peachtree Hotel in downtown Atlanta with my Bible on a red carpet, never will forget it, and I was reading Galatians 4 when all of a sudden it lit up in neon letters and God revealed to me that Jesus was in me. Now, I had read those 200 times that said I was in Christ and it didn't mean a thing until the Holy Spirit revealed him in me in me, Christ in me. When that happened, a whole new world opened up so that I knew it wasn't me living anymore. It was Christ living as me. Galatians 2.20. I had a revelation of Christ. The world changed. Life changed. I've talked to you a long time here through the years. But the ultimate of your walk with God is the Holy Spirit revealing the Son in you. Many of you have head knowledge. That's okay. That's a step. But it's not the ultimate step. 
The ultimate step is when the Holy Spirit reveals His Son in you. That's when life changes to be what God's intention for you is. That's when it changes. And you can put your finger on the time it begins. You can put your finger on the time that God reveals His Son in you. Doesn't mean you'll become perfect because He'll come out of you like you are. But you can put your finger on the moment. And then it grows. Then the revelation never ceases. And that's one of the most oft-used words Paul has in his vocabulary. The revelation of Jesus Christ. God wants to reveal His Son in you. And once you start seeing that Son that's in you, everything in life blossoms according to God's plan and purpose for your life. Because you'll never be a completed human being until you see Christ as your life. You can get every religious experience we've got, but you'll never know who you are in Christ till God reveals His Son in you. So I urge you to live in verses like this. Pray that they'll open up to you. Search the Scriptures till the Word becomes real, and that's all you see is this person, the Word. The Word. Well, that's probably enough said today. I believe this is the best group of people I've ever seen this close to the Father's house.